I just saw yesterday in the backyard um, little tulips were, were yeah. already coming out. Yeah, I don't our know if I've ever seen that in February. There's the buds on the trees are way ahead. Uh, I saw spice bush in bloom in the woods already. It's crazy. So, and that's one of the earliest spring bloomers. So, oh, oh yeah. Um, but then on the, the flip side, I've been out last two nights in a row trying to get woodcock at home, and oh. it's not here yet. So, <laughs> because they're <laughs> smart. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, you get out there and I remember we used to try to schedule them and you get so excited about the first woodcock. And so we would put it on uh, on the calendar to do a woodcock hike in like early March. And, and but you know, it's such a crapshoot that as soon as you put it on a calendar, you know, it's going to snow that day and whatever woodcock may right. arrive. Just and, and shut shut up. Yeah. 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 Uh, I know I've been seeing reports. Are, yeah. The Sandhill cranes have been flying today. And clacking. Oh, did you hear them? Yeah. Yeah. We were seeing them, and I've had a pair of nests behind my house now for about three years, and they come right up to my bird feeders, and they bring their baby oh, along, and it's old enough. And uh, and that's been they've been here for about a, oh probably four weeks, not with the baby, but the the pair is there again. So, yeah, awesome, awesome, cool. So many signs of spring, yeah. and it's February. I I do remember that it just so happens to be that. Uh, 2012. So going back 12 years ago, that was the the spring that we up in the Indiana Dunes had started officially the formal Indiana Dunes longshore bird counter position, and we actually started putting in some funding and accounting every bird. And 2012 was the El Nino year where we had 80s in March, I remember, and we ended up with uh, I think 100s in in August. I was driving to the state fair and there was like uh in the median grass was on fire we were in a drought that year and so uh i'm looking at this february i know oh dear i hope we're not gonna be in store for that mm -hmm. uh but those same years these same birds that we were just now talking about were starting to come in there so uh red winged blackbirds sandhill cranes and what other signs of spring birds do you think of when you think of early march typically uh we haven't seen robins yet, but the the winter ones are around. But we haven't seen big flocks of them yet. Um, the bluebirds have been around all winter. They usually are. Yeah. We can get them into the feeders and such. So, um, but um, I'm not sure we've seen a whole lot of other things coming in yet. I had one of my employees send a picture. She had a siskin on her feeder, which we really didn't see much of an in, in eruption. Like like we had thought we were gonna have, but she did have one at her at her feeder. So I'm yeah, I'm just wondering yeah. if they're heading back north, you know. Very, very likely, I would say so. Yeah, they kind of blew through really fast last mm -hmm. fall in October. We had a few, and then they kind of departed. And so definitely probably the the spring northbound migrants are especially in the winter finches, they're one of the first ones to come. And so, yeah, all good birds seen in the spring. And, and I want to welcome everyone that's on here right now. And whether you're you're here on our Zoom or on our Facebook Live to our uh, little Hoosier Birders Hour. And so it's an opportunity to ask questions that you may have, uh, any kind of bird topic, and allows us to kind of share some of our stories and experiences. Those that don't know, my name is Brad Bumgardner. I'm the Executive Director for Indiana Audubon. I want to share that Whitney Yorger, our communications manager, is with us today. And we have some special guests, too. And uh, if you joined us last month, we were talking about kind of the extreme in the birding. We were looking at big years and and uh, kind of the competition side and just kind of the extreme chasing of birds around the state to see all the different diversity that we have. And so it's kind of nice this month to flip back to the other side and to the most basic beginning level. And uh, and we have actually three great guests that are, that are perfect topic for this because, and see if you guys agree with me, is that in the last couple of years, we had COVID came in and a lot of folks, instead of traveling to, you know, swat mosquitoes in Costa Rica and going to, you know, Southeast Arizona, they found birds at home and they discovered all these cool birds that, that were right there. And so you got bird feeders, you were Hello. buying the uh, landscaping the, the, for the birds and water features and doing all these things to, to take notice to these things that really started to spark you. And in the fact that, that I see in surveys every year for the Indiana Dunes Birding Festivals, we ask people and ask members, how would you classify yourself? Are you a beginner? Are you an intermediate? Are you advanced? Are you an expert birder? 
And about 64% of people every year say they are a beginning birder. And so they're just in that beginning level. They're first starting to take notice of it. They don't need to know the, the secrets of, you know, nocturnal migration and, and where the, you know, the wood thrush is going in any particular month. They just, they just want to see birds and get that excitement. And so we have with us, you know, three experts I mentioned, Carol Harsh, you're with the Wild Birds Unlimited in Northwest Indiana in the Sherryville store. We have Chuck Roth Jr. with Chesterton Feed and Garden, uh, just a longtime staple in the, in the Chesterton Doonling community. And Ted, uh, Ted Stow, you're uh, with Birding Solutions. Formerly, you, you've had experience with Wild Birds Unlimited yourself, and now you've kind of ventured off and, and doing uh, some really cool things uh, that help people connect to birds, too. So I'm glad you guys are here. I got questions for all three of the start, though. As we ask everyone that comes on here, is I want to know what is your spark bird? And so, so we talked about spark birds being that bird that really connects people to birds the first time. It could be a species, an experience. Uh, I often think of this loon that I would see offshore on this lake and just watching it dive for hours and just being so fascinated with that. So you guys, I want to know, like, do you guys have a spark bird and what is it? I'll, I'll go first with that. Um... <clears throat> I'll mix it up a little bit in that I, I feel like there's different phases that I've had spark birds. And so my kind of original spark bird probably was an American goldfinch. I mean, as a kid putting out um, a troll Yankee thistle feeder, and then all of a sudden, you know, being able to see uh, a goldfinch and its bright plumage show up to me, that was, that was kind of special as a kid. Uh, later on, uh, I, I got to grow up in a, in a, in a preserve in Illinois uh, on the north side of Chicago. And we had uh, an eruption year where a snowy owl came to uh, the perimeter of our backyard. And so we had a lot of birders that came in and got to see it. And it was pretty unique experience that, uh, that you know, it's hard to forget. And then when I moved to Indiana, I didn't have the opportunity to see pileated woodpeckers. So moving out here and then getting pileated woodpeckers to me, that was, that was awesome. So those are- kind of kicking off the big ones right there that are that are really good. <laughs> Good spark birds for a lot of folks there. And if you got uh, spark birds too, you put them in the chat or in our Facebook comments. I'd like to compare, see what everybody says. Carol, what, what was yours? Um, affiliated, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. <clears throat> um, I, I've been, uh, since I was a little kid, uh, my brother got me turned on to birds and I had a, I probably, I still have a little golden bird book that I had written down. We camped a lot as kids. And I'd write down in my book where we were and what the date was. And um, but I remember being at Raccoon Lake um, and they have a beautiful uh, bird viewing room there. And that was the first time I saw a pileated and it, I was just astounded. And now living where we at are at in Chesterton, you know, we get them in our backyard and at the feeder. So it's it, it, there's never a dull moment when it comes because even though I've seen it time and time again, it's just such an incredible bird. Yeah, such a memorable bird for a lot of mm -hmm. folks. Um, and great to see that they're expanding and, and we see them more places today than we did 10 or 20 years ago. Yep. And Chuck, I bet you have to think pretty far back. Your father purchased the, the seed, seed in the garden store originally. So you've been like embedded in it in so many years. Uh, do you even remember what a spark bird was? Sure. Yeah, actually, uh, we had just moved to from a subdivision over to where we live now, um, east of Chesterton, and there was wetlands surrounding us, and we were putting in a horse pasture at the time, and we kept hearing this noise. It, it, it seemed like it was in the air, but it was like, well, no, it could, can't be. We don't see anything. And for like a couple of weekends, we heard this and we couldn't identify it. We weren't really even thinking that way at that time. Um, and then my uncle came out and he said, oh, that's a woodcock. And they're they're doing their dives and, you know, the, the wings, how they were. And uh, so that's when I thought, what? <laughs> you know, and so I just started getting more into it and researching that bird. And it went from there. Um, and I probably, a little later on, um, the cedar waxwing. I just was in awe of the coloring and the mask and all that. So it's just really mm -hmm. pretty cool. So, but yeah. Got That's me so more You're interested in thinking about things in that respect, you know. So yeah. You know, you could, you could ask the question from Sparkbird, like, do, do people have favorite birds? And, and I hear people ask me that from time to time. Do you have a favorite bird? And 
a lot of times it's, you know, whatever is next bird, right? <laughs> it's going to be my next favorite one. Because as you get into it, there's so much excitement with different families and and being able to see, uh, it's like you can't compare apples and apples here, comparing a, you know, a, a duck with a hummingbird, so to speak. And I'm surprised no one said hummingbird, too. That's a common spark bird uh, for a lot of folks. We've done a lot of um, kind of basic beginning birding kind of 101 kind of crash course programs. And we've gone around and asked people, you know, what sparks do you have? And and a lot of them that you guys mentioned, the hummingbirds. I had one guy that was just completely dragged into this program because his wife was a birder and she wanted to go to it. So he's sitting there and he's got, oh gosh, I got to come up with a spark bird. What am I going to say? <laughs> so, so we finally got to him. He's like, well, it's the chicken. Huh? <laughs> I really like chicken wings. <laughs> I'm going with chicken. And so that was his spark birds. But uh, uh, we see so many different angles that people get into birds. And uh, whether it's just be like the, the awe of, uh, of migration and flight or just maybe the colorful, you're a photographer, you're picking up the camera first. Uh, when you see customers that you guys are talking to, what is it that you think brought them to you? Was was it a spark experience? Was is it is it the they want to bring things to their home or are they just looking to overall expand that kind of base set of this wow they, they've gotten a little taste of birding what is it you guys see people coming in that are really looking for to grow that that knowledge about birding i i would probably uh, mention housing so bluebirds wrens Chickadees, I mean, uh, I, I see that being, uh, and this is the time of year that when we really see a spike in in sales in houses. What's the number one housing that would, that's easy to support a bird for beginning birder that's like, okay, I can put this up and I'm going to have the best success rate? I think, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh. Yeah, just a rent house, yeah. rent or chickadee house. You can just, you know, most people have uh, access to to a branch and a tree, and um, mm -hmm. they uh, <clears throat> here, like, you know, just something like this, right? So uh -huh. it's, a, it's in an eighth opening, you know, and uh, there's, you know, it doesn't matter which direction, uh, it's right. it's pointing and stuff like that. So that's probably one of the easier ones. Bluebird houses seem to do pretty well too, and there seem to be plenty in the area. But also they they can take other birds nesting in them. So there's usually a success rate. It, it may not be a success rate with the bluebird in it, but it, it you know uh, might be they'll, they'll definitely get in. house sparrows in it, right? That's <laughs> the <laughs> <right>. yeah. <laughs> yeah, guaranteed, probably. There's yep. A whole other rabbit hole there, but <laughs> but yeah, like tree swallows are another good example that, that <laughs> might use that. And I, and I thought the minute I asked, that, I was putting my foot in my mouth because it made based on habitat a lot too. Is like, well, yeah. what do you got? And so, so Ted, I love that you know wrens. You know, you got such a generalist uh, there, and then the fact that you got you know chickadees and nuthatches that that'll check those things out too. Whether you don't have to necessarily be deep in the woods or out in a prairie, so there's a lot of edge habitat that those kind of things are good for. And I didn't really consider you know I've, I've done wrens and done bluebirds, and I was walking the, the trails at Mary Gray Bird Sanctuary. Uh, it was it was last spring. And we stopped at one of the bluebird boxes and expecting a bluebird and out popped a white-breasted nuthatch. And so some of those birds you don't always think of as being cavity nesters that are really cool to get to. And so, right. yeah, sounds like uh, rin boxes, bluebird boxes. Yeah. When you're looking at birds at your property during the breeding season, it's a great way to kind of support them. Uh, other ways to support breeding birds, like if I got... You know, I got your typical suburban lawn, but I got, you know, a few trees and shrubs. You know, how else can I support them as we get into May, June, and July? Yeah, you can, for sure. Um, I mean, I think a big thing would be, um, you know, offering food that they're going to go after. I mean, you've got your mealworms that are always a big draw of so many different birds. So I think that's... It's... Sorry. Yeah, I mean, there is a whole rabbit hole of bird feeding. And the if you have someone that's just starting out bird feeding, what's the kind of the general starter? Like, what do you, what's the first feeder you're going to put out? If you if you don't, you're coming onto a house, you just moved in, and there, there isn't a history of feeders there. 
I think putting out uh, either a platform feeder or a tube feeder that would take a general mix is good because then you can learn what birds are there. Um, you never know whether they have a lot of foliage or cover for them or not, if it's a big open space. So that I think kind of helps to identify what you might have in the area. And then adding a suet to it is usually good because you're, if you've got any trees around, you might have some woodpeckers hanging around. And the suet cakes today are filled with seed anyway, and they they do that purposely to, to attract other birds to that area. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, ideally, if you, if you have the, the resources to spend on like hardware, and you can put poles up and you can put baffles up, you know, it's not a lot of fun to spend that money perhaps on that. But once you've done that, and then you've got arms out for additional feeders to add, you're on your way uh, to really, you know, setting the hobby up for success. You can, if you have a tree, you can put a, a bird feeder out there that's, you know, weight sensitive. So it'll drop down if a predator tries to get it, a raccoon or a squirrel. And then, mm -hmm. um, but you got to make sure that's, you know, further enough away from the tree trunk and can hang down. And there's, there's a good company called Brome, B-R-O-M-E which anyone can look up. It's uh, Rome Bird Care is, is their website and they have really fantastic quality feeders that uh, they mm. stand by. And uh, it's something that uh, I would recommend probably to, to anyone, those types of feeders. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. nice part about Rome too, is they have a lot of, for different varieties. So it's not just a, a general feeder. They'll, they have one that's specific for the finches and for the thistle seed and such. Ah. So mm -hmm. I just mm -hmm. It seems like um, I've noticed just visiting various stores and online that that the the feeder quality has really gone up, and they seem to be kind of some of these are, are treated uh, in ways that they'll kind of prevent them from getting infected and, and getting moldy inside the feeder. They're just kind of drier, and just the quality seems better. I, I don't see the the old feeders anymore that had the old kind of faded cracked plastic. Um, when I look at some of the more modern day feeders, and so. Uh, I think that's that's a big difference I've seen in, in just factoring in some of these predators and squirrels that get on them, that there's so many tailored now that uh, I, I love feeding birds, but I hate when the squirrels are getting in my feeder. It drives me nuts because I got a situation with these these uh, spruce trees that they kind of hang from, and I got a couple poles, and they're always able to find a way to get in there. And 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 I shouldn't say that I was, you know, may or maybe not using a slingshot to try to keep them off, but I eventually did find like a better system and they don't get on there now. And so they're down on the ground feeding. I'm fine with that. They're cool there. And uh, and so a lot of it's just finding that right kind of feeder. And if the first, I guess the take home is the first thing doesn't work. Don't be afraid to try a new system, new setup. Uh, we're smarter than the squirrels. We'll get it figured out for you, right? And you guys, you guys, you know, all three of you guys, you know, are specialty in advising folks what they have and being able to pick out the right feeder for them. Right. Yep. I think a big thing that we try to strive for is, you know, there's a lot of probing questions that you need to ask a customer to make sure you're getting them set up for success um, that we really work through with each, each individual customer. Because like you said, everybody's yard's different. Um, you can't, you know, you can't put up, like you said, a bluebird house and in certain circumstances or um, they don't have a pole system. You got to get your feed, your squirrel proof feeders to, to um, help them be successful because the biggest thing that we see in this, this hobby is people stop feeding because they're having a problem and they don't know what to do. So they just stop doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. There's so many remedies to and solutions for those problems, and it, some of them, you know, don't take a lot of money. Um, it's either changing the food around or changing the pole system, you know. So it makes it, it it can be easier than what they're thinking it is. You, you hope that they ask the questions, you know, when they're in. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if, Chuck, if, you may. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. That customer has like an issue. You know, feel free to to email or take a picture and send it to someone. And a lot of times that helps when we can see the habitat itself and, and see what's going on and give suggestions. We, we can always keep the squirrels off, off the feeders overall. Okay. Sometimes they'll crash into feeders and sometimes they'll try and, you know, grab a seat here and there, but it can be done. Don't give up. It can be done. There's, there's lots yeah. of different, sometimes it costs money. And unfortunately, um, 
but um yeah just just let us know let other people know let some experts know and just take a picture of, of what the scene is yeah yeah chuck you had mentioned uh general seed mix and so what is the best number one seeds uh, for different birds that you might be looking for and like what's what's the favorite one that, that each of you guys like to use well, I think a good a good quality mix is important off the bat, so that you know some will tend to to attract your sparrows and your grackles and starlings. So um, you want to stay away from filler seeds and so on, and seeds that are on the lower end of the scale. Um, but when you get into a good mix that has maybe even it doesn't have to have hulled sunflower, it can have sunflower with shell on, but you know some peanuts and some millet, um, no milo very little corn, just a small amount maybe for the winter heat and such, but um, safflower seed and even the niger seed to attract finches to the feeder. So that, that gives it a chance to get those different varieties in that might be looking for those things. Um, and then you can go to the next level and go to say like a nut and berry mix, uh, which would add the berries to it, which could bring in, you know, your other like some bluebirds and such that may not come to a feeder because they're really looking for berries or mealworms. So, um, but you want you want to at least stay on that higher side of the lower quality mixes to begin with, and and, it, and a lot of it's a price consideration. I and mean, we sell a lot. Our lowest mix doesn't have a lot of filler seed. It has some because it, it has to to make it a lower end mix. But we try to keep it to a minimum. There's not 50, 75 percent millet in like you see in some of these bags. Yeah, you got the best name for yours too, right? Yes. <laughs> it's a cheap, cheap, our, cheap mix, right? Cheap, cheap, cheap mix. <laughs> we, it used to be called wildlife mix. And everybody that would come in, we'd say, you know, we'd go over to them. They'd say, no, I just want that cheap stuff. I, I just want that cheap mix. I just want, so we'd say, okay. So we said, well, let's just go with it. <laughs> and so we named it cheap, cheap, cheap mix. <laughs> Ted, what are your go-to seeds? Yes, I got a little visual here. So <laughs> you got, you know, your typical type of oil sunflower seed always a top notch uh for, for variety of birds you got peanuts in there you got to me so, a seed that's underrated is actually the the white seed the safflower seed uh, that chuck mentioned and now, then, tell me why okay, why is it underrated so safflower does germinate okay any seed that's got a shell and it could fall on the ground and germinate but it's really easy once it germinates you just quickly just pull it out no problem and so if you know you're really concerned about the area underneath the bird feeder yeah it safflower can germinate um i wouldn't even put it in the top you know four or top five of, of like most you know attractive seeds overall but the beauty of safflower is that cardinals still enjoy it titmice still enjoy it chickadees still enjoy it most of the blackbirds uh, don't enjoy it. It's a little bitter. And so, you know, if you have starlings that are coming by and they're pigging out, you can put safflower in a feeder. And sometimes they'll take a look at it. And if it's they're really desperate, then they'll come, you know, eat it, uh, you know, in the middle of winter. But for the most part, I'll have a feeder out there year round uh, in most people's yards. You can put it in the tray. Morning doves eat the whole thing. You clean up sometimes with it, but uh, it's a nice, it's a nice resource okay. for us to have. Um, yes. When you put peanuts or sunflower chips, chips are the sunflower without the shell. Everybody likes that, and that's great. But everybody likes that. So when you need to switch it up a bit and maybe live in a little bit of the mess that's going on out there, um, they're going through it too fast, or they're deciding to decorate the feeders. In a certain way, you know, you can put safflower out there. You can put Niger in the finch feeder for the goldfinches. There's a, the striped sunflowers, another option that's often in these mixes, a little bit less prevalent than some of the uh, oil sunflower. But blue jays love that. Nuthatches love that. Again, starlings have a harder time cracking it open. They got a different type of bill. So it, it's a nice resource to have. Woodpeckers will grab it. You can get your red bellied. Uh, woodpeckers eat that the downies so um there's a lot of options peanuts in the shell is another option blue jays love peanuts in the shell red belly woodpeckers sometimes cardinals grab them uh, and then the starlings can't crack them open so you can put those out so you can put striped sunflower you can put peanuts in the shell you can put safflower you can put niger out there and the starlings 
are not going to be the problem um, that they sometimes can be, especially in wintertime when there's a lot of ice or snow. Mm -hmm. Hey, Ted, have, have you um, done anything or seen anything with the nutrients uh, SAF and germination? Does that tend to not germinate as much as the uh, heavy shell safflower? So I have used that. Uh, it does germinate. That shell, though, is, you know, a little less strong than the actual safflower. So to me, that loses a little bit of the value of putting the safflower out to deter some of the blackbirds. Right. Yeah. Um, so, and then there's the pricing. The pricing has changed over the years oh, yeah. <laughs> with the Nutrisap. <laughs> So the the value in using it to me is not quite there right now. I would like to. I know it, it has some nutritional value. Um, I wish. Now, I what is this? What is the Nutra? Nutra sap. It's, it's a hybrid. Sap. It's a it, hybrid it, safflower, Brad. Right. It's it's got a softer shell on it, mm -hmm. so it doesn't okay. keep the nuisance birds away quite as well as the other. Um, but it gives it's higher in oils and higher in protein than the regular safflower. Okay. I don't know if the birds know that or not. <laughs> yeah. They care, yeah. <laughs> you have to put the trade sheet out there for them. So. <laughs> and Carol, you know, Wild Birds Unlimited really specializes in a lot of where the, the cleaner, no mess type blends of, of the same seeds we've been talking about. Yeah. And so the big advantage there, you would say is the yeah so um the no mess uh it, so those blends are a mixture of sunflower chips uh peanuts and tree nuts and uh it's really our our number one selling blend that we see in addition it does it does cost a little bit more but one bag of it is almost equal to two bags of stuff that's in the shell <clears throat> and everybody eats it i mean everybody sun um uh, having all the sunflower chips um you see a lot of goldfinches going to it as well above and beyond just straight niger in fact when i was feeding with straight niger they were going for the nomas over the niger um but we do sell a blend of that as well that's got chips and 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 niger mixed um it's called a finch blend um and and they they go through that pretty quickly but uh, yeah, the big advantage is, yeah, no mess on the ground. It can't grow. It doesn't kill your grass. And, you know, a lot of um, folks that feed birds are gardeners, so they care about that, that that mess on the ground. They don't want that, have to deal with that. They do enough weeding in their gardens. They don't want to have to do that underneath their bird feeders. So, breaking. Yep. Breaking. yeah, yep. Yes. We actually had a couple feeding questions come in, and, and here's a good one. I don't know the answer to this one. Do dried mealworms have better nutrient value than the live ones? So I guess Cookie's asking, I don't know, Cookie, maybe just try one of each and see. But have you guys heard? I don't yeah, think it would be. It doesn't different. work. I, I would I would say, I mean, and not Ted, Chuck, uh, chime in, that live ones would definitely have more nutritional value, I think, than than dried. I would what say you would I, lose. I agree with that. Okay, so go for the live ones, Cookie. I'm guessing those are the ones that cost more too, right? They, they also taste better, Cookie, when they're going down. Yep. Something else. To keep in, something else to keep in mind. Cookie, we'll have those back in stock in a couple, probably about a month, so you can come by and sample them if you'd like. <laughs> it's good to uh, with with mealworms. They're calcium depleting, so sometimes people get a. A little bit carried away with the amount of mealworms they'll put out. So uh, when birds are trying to, you know, uh, it, you know, lay eggs and uh, trying to produce calcium, it's a good idea to maybe use some eggshells and put them and mix them in yep. with your mealworms. Um, you can bake them like at 200 degrees for, you know, 20 minutes and uh, then just kind of break them up and, and add them to your mealworms um and that way they'll grab them and, and grab some calcium sometimes we don't want to kind of overdo the copious amounts of, of food choices it's good to have a little bit of variety yeah uh, that's something to keep in mind uh with mealworms and, and live mealworms certainly do go faster um as far as birds choice so they're cut to that question the birds might know something that we don't do anything that's you know closer to being alive or um uh, more more recently uh, the birds are interested in uh, for for some of those reasons some of the uh 
there's suet nuggets, the dough nuggets that have a lot of good um, vitamins, minerals, and the seed mix in with it, uh, ground up. But that helps to do that same thing. So you can mix that right in with the mealworms for their diet. Good point. Yep. It's hard to find mealworms. Any of you guys carry the meal live mealworms? I don't carry them through the winter. I'll bring them back in probably about a month. And then I'll carry them through probably August. We mostly Lizard. carry fried mealworms. Mm -hmm. Same. Yeah, this follows up uh, as an alternative to eggshells. What is an alternative to, for a calcium source? Yeah, you can buy calcium powder too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But, you yeah. know. If you can get finely ground oyster shells, the smaller grade oyster shells, that works too, like you do for chickens, or you mm -hmm. can throw it in your Cuisinart and grind it down. But um, that that works good too, and it's a real fast form of calcium. Yeah, okay. and birds are always looking for slugs in your yard and things like that too, for, for mm -hmm. those reasons. Yeah. The other question we had was somebody was, so it's kind of, there's a perennial thing that I think you guys probably get it every year. You get that phone call, where are all my birds? They're all gone. There must be some shortage in the community. It's, you know, is there a die off going on? Because birds aren't coming to my feeder. And I found nine out of 10 times, like maybe, you know, like the thistle seed that you got out there is probably bad. The like goldfinches know, but we don't know. And it seems to be one of the seeds that, that goes bad the easiest in that it's, easiest to buy at like a big box store where you don't know it's been in a warehouse that like nothing eats it. And then I go somewhere else and I buy the same, you know, Niger again, put it in the feeder and boom, all my goldfinches are there. So like, what is like, what's the best dues for, because it is expensive. We know it's grown in Africa and shipped over. So like, how do you make sure you have the best thistle and thistle feeders for goldfinches since it generally costs more to feed those birds? I mean, buying from a store where you know don't go don't go to big box and buy <laughs> yeah, it there I mean, the that's the that's the that's yeah. the way to go so <laughs> make sure you come to a specialty store where where you know it's not yeah housed and been sitting around so because it yeah it doesn't it doesn't the shelf life is that long on it so yeah, yeah. carol made a great point with with the goldfinches love sunflower chips niger does finish second to to sunflower chips uh, great it's great that we can have a finch feeder that's dedicated to goldfinches but something that to always keep in mind is when you have a feeder that's dedicated to one bird over time throughout that year there are times where that bird is not going to be interested in coming to that feeder because there's other natural food sources out there such as coneflower when they'll go to the coneflower they're on the nest uh, they're moving in their circuit so there's times where the feeder just gets ignored just because there's other options. And this is true for a lot of the seed that we put out. You know, when there's a bounty of insects and things like that, the birds are going to go for that. You'll see it again with cicadas this year and things like that. So I, I would put less Niger out there when you're not seeing the type of activity. Don't You don't have to fill it all the way up to the top. Make sure you got a top over it, keeping the moisture out. Move the seed around. I empty some of it from the bottom. Uh, get uh, periodically every time I go out there, just I'm going to take five, 10 percent out of it. You can put that in a tray. Doves will eat it. Junkles will, will eat that stuff, too. And then this seed is old because it's been brought from Ethiopia or India. There's a lag time. It's last year's. Right. We're working off last year's crop oftentimes. So you got to keep that in mind. And once it's in your house, you're going to want to get that out as fast as possible. It has a very brittle, thin shell. And that can be corrupted by water too, and moisture and humidity in August and July and things like that too. Originally, they were steam sterilizing it right in the ships, and they would take these probes and then blow steam through it to heat it up because they had to kill the germination. And through that, it got a reputation for becoming moldy before it even got to us. And so I think that 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 people who remember that it still lingers. So as soon as they see some. Uh -huh bad thistle they assume that but i don't even think they're sterilizing it the same way anymore because they had so much trouble but it's more because of the seed shrinking losing its oil becoming distasteful like uh gotcha Ed and carol were saying so. yeah there's a way Is people it? can test their niger so they just need to take like a white piece of paper 
put some kernels on it, smash it with the back of a spoon. And then if it, if it just breaks up and there's no oily residue, then it's, it's no good. So. Oh, okay. We can try. Do you think, do we, do you have it long enough in the course of its process from, you know, getting shipped and packaged to, to being in a tub in your house? Are there things that we should be doing with that seed to like, you know, vacuum seal it or because a lot of times they're just sitting in bags out in my garage. And so do I need to be treating the, the open bag of thistle in the you know month that may be at my house differently than I would like a sunflower bag? I would keep it in a closed container, try to keep it in a dry, cool place if you can. I mean, that's for, I think any seed, it, it's going to help with the, the quality of it, the life of it by, by trying to do that. Don't buy too much at one time. A lot of people want to save money by buying, you know, a 50 pound bag or a 25 pound bag. But if you're not going to use that up in a two month period, then don't purchase it that way. Yeah. You know, yeah. Don't buy smaller amounts. And then throughout the year, like with the finches, we definitely see the migration and uh, you'll, you'll see the, you know, ones that are brightly colored leave. And then there's no activity that might be for a week and might be for three weeks. And then all of a sudden we see the khaki green ones show up, you know, with the winter color. Well, during that time, that thistle sits in that feeder and it could have heavy rains that blow in the holes and it's not being exchanged out. So it gets moldy and the birds know that they go up to it. You'll see them grab a seed, they'll shake it and throw it out. And they'll do that a few times and they'll just leave. And then they leave the feeder alone. So really during those times, you really need to take the feeder down, clean it out good, fill it with a small amount of seed, like Ted said, and you know, for any that are lingering, but otherwise, you know, you need to keep the feeders clean and you need to keep that seed moving. Yep, rotate it out, yep. For thistle, July is one of my favorite favorite months for feeding uh, Niger seed, just because you have this little pause where all the our local breeding birds are, are eating insects and, and bugs and such. But the goldfinches, you know, there's, they haven't bred yet. They're still coming to the feeders and they kind of become like the highlight for July, I think. of. And so that's a great month I usually think of that I'm feeding them a lot and then picking up again in the winter when those winter finches are coming down. Goldfinches aren't quite as bright uh, as they are. Pam asks, uh, keep in cardboard storage rather than plastic tubs. Yeah, no. Make a difference. Well, plastic tubs, I think, are better as long as they're, you're not building up moisture. Yeah. Um, cardboard, you, you still might get the, uh, if it's dry cardboard, if it's wax, it may be different, but it might be pulling moisture out of the seed, you know, especially on the mm -hmm. hull seeds. Mm -hmm. And I suppose an industrious rodent. Could probably get through that as well. <laughs> Pretty easily. <laughs> yeah. Um, somebody had mentioned, uh, and you guys were talking about seeds, if we want it really fresh, then you grow your own. You could like sunflowers out in the backyard. So uh, obviously, Chuck, you got the garden center. Uh, you know, what, what are your number one plants you're selling for birds for, for the customers that are wanting to support birds in their backyards? Right. So, uh, I mean, you can do that with a lot of annuals, too, you know, so even just growing your sunflowers, um, if you're trying to grow it, so many people want to grow it and then um, store it for the winter time. but you better beat the birds to it, because if it ripens on the plant, they're going to get to it before you do. So you, you need to take some like cheesecloth and wrap it around the heads. And it's a lot of work. So um, probably that's too. Yes, right. So if you just if you want to grow it to see them come to the yard and eat it right off the plant, that's a great idea. But it's going to be work to, to get it to harvest. Um, but cone flowers are another one uh, that they like. Um, the some of the thistle family, not the noxious thistles, but the other ones um, that are available, globe thistle and such, they go after that. Um, berries, uh, a lot of the bluebirds and other birds like the berry treats, so you can plant berry bushes in the yard. Some that we consider edible, blueberries and such, um, but others also, you know, viburnums and things that the birds will go after, and it also provides cover for them. So. Oh, yeah. I have a yes. question for no you, Chuck. What, yeah. what do you see the top sale, uh, sale of uh, annual or perennial when it comes to hummingbird? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, well, um, probably, you know, there's hibiscus, you know, people like the flower, but the hummingbirds are also attracted to it. But also the um, salvia sage family produces a lot of nectar. And in a flower like that, it's covered so that in rains and such, it doesn't wash the nectar out. And as, as a beekeepers, we think of that too. We try to get flowers that are going to be contained so that when it rains, it doesn't just wash the nectar out. So those are more the way they grow. The bird can access the nectar, but it's not being flushed out every time through rain. So those types of flowers, I think, across the board are pretty popular for that. And there are both annual and perennial salvia sages. Yeah, I think you, 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 if you look out back and you just got nothing but, you know, monoculture of green grass, it seems like, oh, how am I going to get all these birds? And I'm not going to draw them in. But, you know, it just starts with one, you know, one at a time. And and then you see that house that's been planting native and you see the the summer cone flowers and the cardinal flower. And you see just the the insects and the birds that are enjoying that and what they're able to draw in there. And it's 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 I think, you know, more rewarding than just the feeder aspect, too. Is, is be able to host them, watch them breed, the young go off, and, and to turn your house not into like an ecological sink, but you're actually producing more birds uh, through a property like that. And Ted, down in Indianapolis, you have birding solutions, and you're able to help homeowners with a lot of different aspects of enjoying birds, correct? Yes. Um, so, yeah, I, I will set up different hardware for people, houses, um, I can, uh, for a lot of people, I, I'll do maintenance, uh, weekly for them for mm -hmm. hospitals and senior centers and dental offices and things like that. And so the, some of their customers can enjoy it too, but I, I try and take a little bit of the guesswork out, um, for, for different, uh, my customers. And then I, I'll try and change things up as the seasons go. So I'll put different feeders out there, different seeds out there. Cause you know, sometimes it can get, you know, get a little stale sometimes, and uh, it's nice to be able to put out, you know, a hummingbird feeder or an oriole feeder and, and try for different things or watch the weather and see. Um, it was maybe one of my suggestions for a lot of people, you know, to pay attention to what the weather's looking like in the next week. Maybe that'll change, you know, what type of seed you put out there, which ones can handle some of the moisture and things like that. But um, yeah, um, so that's, uh, I, I do sell stuff, uh, suet and, and bird seed and, and feeders and stuff as well, but primarily I'm out in the field. And your main area that you're in is Indy and the surrounding counties beyond there? Yeah, mostly Indy, Zionsville, Carmel, Westfield, the Northwest Indianapolis area. So if folks are in central Indiana, uh, they would visit your website, which is? You can do uh, birdingsolutions.com. So birdingsolutions.com. Mm -hmm. What would you guys say the the biggest do if you are starting fresh and you're trying to draw in birds to someone who's got a spark and wants to see more in your yard and the biggest don't? Yeah, don't, don't, don't just put up one feeder. <laughs> <laughs> Buy more feeders. Buy more feeders. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I you mean, that's, on? but that's true. I mean, if, if you're only putting one feeder yeah, up, maybe. you're going to see less birds. You're going to, you're going to, um, and, and to the, to the point about, um, I think Ted, you talked about, you know, putting out that mono, it's just one bird going to be able to go to it by going with a goldfinch. You know, we, we talk to people about foundational feeders that everybody can get on and eat from, um, Chuck, you talked about a platform or, tray feeder i mean those those things that are going to help draw more birds in but if you only have one and you're going to see that that hierarchy i was reading about that that cornell had something out the other day um of birds you know pushing in and out uh you know starlings coming in and taking over that one feeder and you're not going to see anything but them yeah the, also like just diversifying either the, the seed mix the seed or the feeder itself to accommodate different birds is a good idea. So, and a lot of times the, the beginning birder doesn't want to start out putting a whole lot of money in it. You know, they had their spark and so they're coming in and they're kind of feeling their way through. So, but you can start out slow and you can start out inexpensive, like instead of a, a $50 Niger thistle feeder, you can go to a sock and fill the 
Niger sock with it. And that gives them the opportunity to see if those are around or are going to come. And once they see that, then they can go to upgrade, you know, to a bigger feeder, a better feeder. Yeah, that's a good start. Uh, you know, oftentimes, you know, it's someone who's been feeding for a while, I don't buy socks, you know, I got higher volume and they're not going to last long. But but when I have put them out and I've had them, those goldfinch, they figure it out. They know what those are. So if you're going to know right away if you have finches and whether you should invest, uh, that that is a kind of cool idea just to start out with something like a sock. Yes, we uh, back in, it was it was before I owned the store. I was working for the previous owner, so this must have been in seventy five, nineteen seventy five. I, I don't think any of you on the screen were born then. So <laughs> is that was uh, birds were black and white. <laughs> <laughs> But we, uh, somebody came to us, and um, in our area, at least, uh, Niger thistle, and it was called thistle at the time, was unheard of. You know, people just didn't do that. And so he came to us, and he had seen it somewhere in Wisconsin and, and what it, how it attracted finches. So he came down and was asking us about it. He lived in this area. And we searched around for a bag. The, the previous owner searched around for a bag. And the guy that we got most of our feed from said he was over in Hammond. And he says, I can get it. It comes in a 110 pound bag. There's probably going to be less than a hundred pounds in it, but you're going to pay for 110 anyway. And I forget the price of it, but it was some phenomenal amount, $5 a pound or something crazy like that to us wholesale. And so we went back to the, guy and said, well, we'll split the bag with you because he was bragging about so much. We will split it with you. And we she practically sold it to him at cost just to, you know, get the ball rolling. Well, it was very shortly after that we we put it out and we just put it in a regular feeder because there wasn't even Niger theater feeders at the time. And we put it out um, and it was incredible. As fast as you hung it up and walked away from it, it was full of birds. It just in back then you'd get 30 to 40 birds at a feeder, you know, hanging around waiting for a turn on the feeder. And now I don't see quite that many, but it, it was incredible during those days. Um, to the point where up in uh, Michigan, Sarah Nature Center, they used to take the whole burlap, 110 pound burlap sack and put it on a meat hook and hang it in the tree. And it was just covered with the birds. It was crazy. So it's kind of bird crack. Run the <laughs> all that. Can't imagine how many red poles you could get with something like that hanging. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Place like Surat. That's pretty cool. Uh, you said don't for don't uh, have uh, you know just one feeder. Uh, you get you know someone that occupies a feeder. I see the same thing happens in hummingbirds too, where you get like a male and you think, oh, I got a feeder here and a feeder here, so everyone can share it. But that male's up top and he sees them all, and and he's playing the long game and he can kind of cover and defend all those different feeders. So so people often ask you know in terms of don'ts is when when do I put them up? When do I not have it up yet? When do I, how long can I wait? Do I leave it up? Are the birds not going to migrate? So we haven't really talked much about hummingbird feeders, but it's really not too far away. Like when would you guys start putting up your hummingbird feeders? Uh, when should people do it? And should they, is there a date they need to take it down? I, I would say we tell people to put it up on tax day and we tell them to keep it up as late as Halloween because they could get some migrators moving through then, so. Yeah, I think like Cornell Corn has been pretty profound on the fact that you're not gonna keep birds here by leaving the feeder up. So the old, I mean, I don't know whoever picked out this date, but September 15th, you know, and how do the birds know that, you know? So um, I think that leaving them up, and we had one here, Brad, if you remember, was that five years ago? And it was a week before the Christmas bird count, and it was in Velcro. Yeah. And we had pictures of it with snow in the on the feeder and in the background. And the, wow. the poor little thing was there. Uh, I was almost going to buy him a plane ticket to get out of here. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but we were hoping we'd pick that up on the bird count that year. And, of course, it was yeah. gone. Yeah, it was yeah. gone by then. Yeah. Just, just days before it. Yeah. So, yeah, that, so that, that reminds me. The feeders help them down through as they're migrating through, you know. Yeah. Birds migrate for 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 food and or for yeah for food source not because of weather they're actually pretty tough 
but it's just, you know, maintaining yeah. the protein and the nectar in the winter, it's a little tough here. Yeah, and they say that the light, dark and light cycle of the day triggers the migration. Well, what, a hundred different things trigger migration. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even for us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I I am yeah similar just before May first and then um, yeah this mid September and you know early on when you're putting out uh, hummingbird feeders I wouldn't fill them all the way to the top keep in mind that the, the hummingbird have the ability to lap up some of the nectar so if you have it out there for a couple of days um, yeah just go maybe halfway until you start seeing them and then you can fill it back up you know all the way it but as the season go progresses then I'll I'll, I'll add more and more um, throughout the summer. And then, uh, yeah, just keep those feeders clean if you can, because um, some of the mold will definitely definitely grow out there in the heat. Yep. For sure. I, uh, I think, too, um, uh, a lot of people, <clears throat> they're reactive when it comes to feeding hummingbirds and orioles. Um, and that's where, like, like um, you asked the question, Brad, making sure you have it out there before they get here. That's the key, because you're going to see more birds, uh, particularly with orioles you know a lot of people don't put their feeders out till they see one and you know how many passed by your yard already that you mm -hmm. could have seen because you had the food out there earlier than than later so yeah 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 you know, climate change you know we, we've recorded bird migration in indiana is is now a week earlier than it was 30 years ago and things are migrating up to a week later now specifically so we're getting out records of hummingbirds entering Indiana, you know, in the first week of April, even April 7th, April 6th, way down on the Ohio River. And so I think as we see more of that, we're in an El Nino year, I think we're going to see hummingbirds showing up uh, earlier around the state this year. So uh, tax day, uh, if not sooner, probably for 2024. And obviously you can keep them up a little later, uh, you know, but the, the big take home that you mentioned is that keeping that feeder is not going to deter them, you know, so you can keep it up through Halloween or even longer until they freeze. Uh, and you never know, you get that situation where it's December and there's still a ruby throated hummingbird that's looking for a little extra energy to, to make his uh, way back down to, to Costa Rica for the winter. So uh, a lot of great advice uh, that you guys have offered today for beginning birders. And I think the real take home is, is, is like we saw in COVID, so many folks, got an interest in birds and a spark right here in your own home. And so you can keep that going in your backyard, you know, see a lot of different birds. And Indiana Audubon is a great opportunity too, because there's uh, so many different resources that we have, in addition to the great experts in the community that have the different organizations and, and bird feeding stores that can help you out. I do want to mention that today happens to be the last day for the Indiana Audubon, kind of our, our great backyard bird count membership drive. And so there's some great Knox binoculars and bird feeders and everything you need for beginning birding uh, that you can go into a drawing for today. So if you're not an Indiana Audubon member, you can join uh, by midnight tonight and you get an, uh, into that drawing. And uh, you have to be a member if you want to jump the gun on March 1st for the Indiana Dunes Birding Festival, too. And so uh, that's that's a big one on March 1st. Some folks I thought might have some questions today. But on Sunday, we have a specific uh, happy hour for the IDBF. And so we'll have uh, Sam and the guides uh, around. Uh, grab a drink. You can join us live on Zoom. And we'll be just talking about tips for registering, some of the different trips. We're up to 180 trips and workshops for this year's festival. So get in, any of the information you want. You can join us for this happy hour. It's uh, Sunday at uh, 6 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. Eastern. And uh, there's links on the uh, Indiana Dunes uh, Birding Festival Facebook page. And you may be getting a weekly e-blast too. So you'll probably get something later today to remind you about that. So that's coming up this Sunday for registration beginning March 1st. And so we will see upwards to about seven, 800 people register in the first couple of weeks. And so uh, it's gotten huge. <laughs> and Chuck, you're right there in the middle of it, being in Chesterton. And, and we've got a lot of support from Wild Birds Unlimited too. And so it just, it takes an army, a community of bird lovers to be able to put an event like that together. And so we're so excited to see registration start because 64% are beginning birders. And we love sharing so many of those different things that you can do, whether you're you're helping the birds in your backyard or you're you're doing it traveling abroad. And so so many ways you can do it with Indiana Audubon. So if you're not a member, please join us. Uh, join us next month for our Hoosier Birder Hour. And I want to thank uh, Chuck, Carol, and Ted for joining us and, and letting us pick your brain about all the cool beginning birding topics. Thanks, guys. It's been Thanks a pleasure. Thank you for having Thanks. us. All right. Wonderful meeting, everyone. Thanks.
Yeah, you too. If you have any questions, you're on Facebook, uh, feel free to put them in the comments. We'll answer them afterwards and we'll have a, a copy of the recording too for anyone that might want it. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks. Have a great day. Thanks, have a great to the kitchen. <laughs>